Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to another SIPS event. Uh, my name is Rita Abrahamson. I'm a professor in the Graduate School of Public and International Affairs. And my very pleasurable task today is to introduce our speaker, Nicholas van der Waal from Cornell University. Nicholas van der Waal is Maxwell M. Upton Professor of Government at Cornell, where he's also at the moment the chair of the Department of Government. So that means he's a very busy man and we're very, very pleased to have him here today. As most of you will know, I'm sure, is uh, you will know that uh, Nick van der Waal is one of the most uh, influential scholars when it comes to democracy, democratization, and more broadly speaking, politics in Africa. He has written a lot on democratization, on issues of aid and reform, the politics of economic reform, and also on aid effectiveness. Um, I think I'll just mention two landmark studies. The book that uh, Nick van der Waal did with uh, Michael Bratton in 1997 called Democratic Experiments. And then uh, a couple of years later in 2001, I think I remember, the the book called African Economies, the, the, the Permanent Crisis in Africa. I think I jumbled those words a bit, but both of those studies on Africa's uh, permanent crisis and the democratic experiments are two landmark studies that have continued to influence how we think about democratization in Africa and the issues of the relationship between political reform and economic reform. So today, Nick van der Waal is gonna to talk to us about the relationship about with democracy and economic growth votes and growth in Africa. It's again uh, uh, a study that is, uh, I think, likely to influence how we think about democratization in Africa. So please join me in welcoming Professor Nick van der Waal to Ottawa and to SIPS. Yeah, great. Thank you very much. Thank you for the, the nice introduction. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, and uh, I'm uh, happy to uh, I, I thank you for coming. I understand it's uh, you're, you were on the cusp of a holiday, so I'm sure you're thinking about other uh, other things. So thank you for coming. Um, can you hear me? Is the, the yeah okay all right. So so um, yes. I, I uh, w let me let me uh, um, start right away. So let me make sure. Okay. So what is the motivation for the paper? Well, you know, the, the current era in Africa uh, suggests a conjunction of, at the same time, the last two decades ha has witnessed a great deal of economic growth. Uh, indeed, the best growth rates uh, really in the, in the post-colonial history of the continent. So if, if uh, average growth rates in the ni 1980s was l uh, slower than population growth, 1.7%, by the, by the 90s, 1990s, on average, it had gone up to 2.5%. And since the uh, beginning of, of this century, it has been above 5%. In, in, uh, 19, in, in 2013, for example, the growth rate in the continent is 5.6%, and a third of the countries in the region are growing by more than 6% a year. Uh, this is not East Asian miracle levels, but it is, uh, in, in other words, more than three times faster uh, than had been the, the case for much of the post-colonial era. Uh, and it's, it's broad-based growth. It, it, uh, it, uh, it um, uh, uh, is affected by certain things like commodities, which are, uh, benefit some countries more than others, but a lot of countries in Africa are, are, uh, are going through their best years. Okay? At the same time, uh, the last two decades uh, has seen a very real opening up of African uh, polities uh, uh, with very, very real democratization. Uh, uh, certainly, we've had the, root, the routinization of multi-party electoral competition, even if maybe only 10, depending on how you define it, of the countries in the region are real democracies. But, but certainly, there, there are virtually no countries in the region which are less democratic, less politically open today than they were, say, 25 years ago. Okay? So um, what, what is very curious about this era is that no one is saying that these two phenomena are related. Uh, indeed, um, increasingly, uh, I think there's a kind of backlash 
against the economic effects of democracy. And as I will suggest, there's a kind of what I would call a, a neo-modernization school which has emerged, which suggests that democracy in low-income countries, more specifically in Africa, is bad for economic growth. And, and that is a curious thing. Okay? So uh, 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 the, the, my paper has really two objectives. One is I want to investigate the link between growth and regime type in Africa over the course of the last 30 years, right? Uh, as I will suggest in a second, it's possible to think of, of, of this relationship as, as being uh, specific to time and region. So uh, no one has really examined this link systematically. Let's examine the link systematically. Uh, but in addition, um, I am curious about the current anti-democratic uh, fashion and, and where it comes from. I, I'll say more about the former objective of this paper simply because it's, uh, it takes longer to say it. Um, uh, but then I will uh, end with a number of comments about, uh, about this backlash and, and try to uh, explain it. Okay? Uh, it's, it's uh, yeah. All right. So uh, let, me, let me say this is very much work in progress. Um, and uh, I, look, I very much look forward to uh, your, your comments. Uh, I'll, I'll, have, I'll say a word about theory, about how people have thought over the years. And this is actually one of the sort of great topics in, in political economy, is the link between regime type and, and economic growth. So I'll, I'll talk about the theory. I'll present the models that I'm working on with a colleague. I, for those of you who are econometricians, um, you will be disappointed. Uh, I, I, I will, the paper, one of the papers uh, that this talk is based on is, uh, has a number of econometric regressions, but they're more the work of my co-author than they are of my work. And uh, um, uh, uh, I'm not sure I could respond to very technical econometric uh, uh, questions. I'll, I'll provide some of these econometric results more in just the broad tendencies that they suggest. Uh, and then I'll, I'll end with some comments about why we why in particular the policy community, but I think too many people in the academic community, continue to believe in an authoritarian advantage uh, in terms of economic growth, okay? Um, uh, this really primarily involves two papers. One which is more or less finished with uh, a, a student, a doctoral student at, at Cornell, Takamasaki. Um, this is a paper that is coming out in the new Oxford Handbook of African Economies. Uh, secondly, a paper in progress. Uh, actually, uh, to be honest, it's more like two papers in progress. Uh, as as uh, Rita suggested, I'm chairing my department which means I have a lot of stuff I haven't finished. Um, uh, and, uh, but they're, and they're more sort of um, uh, qualitative essays uh, of uh, sort of what I view as sort of the sociology of knowledge uh, uh, and, 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 and why people want to believe that democracies don't do as well as authoritarian systems. Okay? All right. So um, there is um, a long tradition of thinking about this relationship. It really goes back uh, to uh, the 50s. Uh, and um, uh, I'm going to start with these, this long tradition uh, going back to the modernization school of an authoritarian advantage. There are really three different arguments about why democracies don't do as well as authoritarian systems in promoting economic growth. There, there is first uh, the redistribution argument. Okay? And this is that the view that, that goes back indeed to Edmund Burke in the 19th century, that, that democracy undermines property rights because the majority are going to be poor and they are going to covet the property rights of the rich. Okay? And um, uh, 150 years of participatory politics in the West with very, very limited redistribution has not shaken the view that this is actually something uh, that is inherent to, to participatory politics. Okay? Um, there's a curious 
uh, version of this in some of the newer work, notably by David Booth, which argues that in poor neo-patrimonial state, state elites themselves, not the poor, but state elites, uh, undermine the property rights of the rich and of business to finance their own elections. Okay? Uh, but I, it, I think it's in the same class of argument about redistribution taking place, and, and sorry, unsafe property rights. Right? A second argument, and I, and I must say these are related, they're, they're definitely uh, uh, linked as, as arguments, is what, is what I call the low investment argument. This is the idea that democracy undermines uh, investment to favor current consumption. Uh, largely because of participatory pressures. Uh, electorate officials, uh, particularly before an election, they want to improve people's welfare to win the election. And thus they defer or underinvest in investment, in the production of investment goods. Okay? Uh, I uh, remember my undergraduate text in economics uh, by uh, uh, Baghwadi. 1968, very famous textbook that people in my generation invariably read, suggested that there was a cruel choice between economic development and democracy for precisely this reason. Okay? Um, uh, a version of this argument is not related to democracy, but specifically democracy in low-income countries, and suggests that, that um, uh, uh, a la Huntington, uh, you know, that the problem in developing countries is not the form of government, but really how much government, because these countries don't have enough government. And, and Huntington, in his work with Joe Nelson, No Easy Choice, the book, it comes out in the early 70s, suggests that democracies just are not able to fight, particularly when they have weak institutions, are not able to fight these participatory pressures, and thus break down and accede to populist uh, uh, demands from the population. Okay? And then finally, the developmental dictatorship argument that suggests that authoritarian leaders are more autonomous from society. They're more protected. They can use repression to avoid participatory pressures. And thus, they're better able to make the tough choices uh, that promote uh, development. Here, the a whole large literature in the, in the um, uh, I was going to say the 80s, but um, uh, I see these, my citations are from the 90s, but the sort of 80s and 90s, uh, 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 Wu Cummings, the Haggard book, uh, more complicated way, people like Atul Kohli, uh, stuff like that. Okay? All, right. All right. So um, these, these arguments have really existed since the uh, early 1950s, but what is really striking is the extent to which they are coming back today. Uh, whether it is the, the work of Paul Collier, uh, Jeffrey Sachs makes some of these arguments, uh, the um, uh, Mohammed Khan uh, at the University of London, or most, I think most completely and intelligently, uh, the African Power and Politics Program led by uh, David Booth. And I, and I really think that what we are seeing is um, um, a neo-modernization theory. So let's look at these quotes from David Booth and, and Kahn in a new book edited by, 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 uh, by Stiglitz, the Nobel Prize winner. Um, Booth writes, the trouble with democracy is that its effectiveness depends on social and economic conditions that may not be present and are not yet enjoyed in most developing countries. Uh, democratic politics generates policies that are the opposite of those required for successful economic transformation. Booth is, uh, would would say well the key word here is transformation not growth and he would he would uh, add all sorts of caveats but this is largely the the modernization argument about you know the need to promote growth first strengthen institutions first and then after that is all done then you'll get uh, um, you, you can you can have democracy similarly uh, Khan writes democracy in the least developed countries remains fragile because conflicts over resources are intense particularly between competing political factions. Democracy deserves support as an end in itself, 
echoes of Bhagwati's uh, cruel choice, um, but should not be confused with the more difficult task, democracy's frivolous, uh, of creating governance capabilities for supporting growth. Okay? Um, I, I think this is very, very striking. Collier devoted a whole book to these types of arguments called Democracy in Dangerous Places, uh, which makes a variety of these, these, kinds, of, uh, these kinds of arguments. Interestingly, however, all of, the, of these arguments have been balanced in the literature, in the academic literature, for a very long time with, with um, sort of parallel arguments ex arguing exactly the opposite. So, um, uh, and arguing for a democratic advantage. So North, Doug North, the Nobel Prize winner, actually argues that democracy better provides guarantees for property rights than authoritarian governments. Unlike Booth, he worries about leaders, including patrimonial leaders, who are not accountable to an electorate. They are more likely to steal uh, or to, uh, to undermine the property rights of, of the rich. Right? Similarly, um, uh, people like Baum and Lake showed uh, about, uh, well, almost over 10 years ago that, that participatory pressures increase public goods provision uh, such as education and health. And those investments in, in public goods actually increase uh, the prospects for economic growth. David Savage has much the same argument uh, based specifically on African materials. Um, Jaworski had already said a bit before that while true that, that democracies promoted less investment, they tended to promote better investment because they were less likely to promote white elephants like famously the Basilica of Yamasukru. Okay? Um, right? And then finally, uh, Shedler is one of many people uh, to argue that the greater accountability of leaders leads to better performance. Uh, uh, you know, simply put, in an authoritarian government, it's very hard to get rid of a bad leader. In a democracy at the next election, the bad leader can be voted out. And that, that accountability um, uh, for, I think, uh, uh, Different people would suggest that, that maybe occasionally, exceptionally, you get a very good leader who's authoritarian, and it's good that he's in power for 15 years because he's doing good things or she's doing good things, but it's mostly he's. Um, uh, uh, but on the other hand, you, you also can't get rid of a, of a disastrous leader. And, and that would explain why the, when we think of the really disastrous economic basket cases in the third world, they tend to be authoritarian. But when we think of, for example, the five East Asian countries, um, they tend to be authoritarian as well with, with their economic miracles. Okay? All right. Uh, yeah. Okay. What is the econometric evidence uh, uh, on this debate? After all, it, is, it should be an empirical debate. Um, uh, a recent article by, I'm, I'm not good at pronouncing these kind of names, but Duku, Duku Liagos and Ulu Basoglu uh, uh, surveyed 84 studies that had occurred in the last couple decades on this relationship. And they conclude very tentatively that there's no evidence uh, that, uh, that democracy has a negative effect. Okay. Now this is for a global sample, and one of the things they say at the end of the, global, at the, of the study is that there seem to be very strong regional effects. And that, that is one of the motivations for doing a study just of the African cases. Okay. Um, good question then, 84 studies, why have an 85th study? Uh, well, the first reason I've just given, this relationship probably uh, varies across across regions. If we do a study of East Asia, there's every region to every reason to expect an authoritarian advantage. Studies of Latin America, on the other hand, have typically shown a democratic advantage. Okay? So uh, a, a, a specific regional study allows us, I think, to, to state not, not anything about the, re, the general relationship, but about the, gener, the relationship in Africa in the last three decades. Okay? Um, all right. Uh, secondly, the African growth literature uh, really didn't look at 
uh, at political institutions. Uh, you know, you think of, of uh, um, of Easterly and Levine's work on the African growth tragedy, where the culprit for the tragedy is ethnic conflict. Okay, uh, Anglebert and and uh, Jeff Herbst, the conflict is the artificial state, uh, and the the sort of uh, yes, uh, uh, the, the artificial boundaries is the key variable in Anglebert's regression. Uh, similarly. Uh, Sachs and Warner talk about poor growth in Africa, but blame geography, landlocked states, and uh, the tropical uh, problems, right? And Bob Bates uh, basically blames interest groups. Now, he comes the closest to such because one might assume interest groups, one could link interest groups to participatory politics, uh, but he's, he's talking about how well organized interest groups are rather than the nature of political institutions. Right? So we, we, we have not really looked at uh, the effect of regime type on, on growth. Um, finally, there, there's a surprising dearth of, of these studies. Uh, so there was a handful of them that came out five, six years after democratization occurred. I, I'm responsible for one of them, which basically looked at one cycle of elections. We now have 20 years of democracy. Most of these countries have had four or five elections. So there, you know, there's, there's more uh, stuff to look at. And I think it's sort of timely having now gone through over more than two decades and having sort of enough data uh, to start looking at this relationship uh, more, more carefully. Right. All right. Um, the fourth reason, I think, is that I'm, I've been dissatisfied with this literature in a variety of ways. And I think we improve on the literature in, um, in, in, in several ways. The first is, is that we use an ordinal scale uh, rather than a zero, one variable. It is striking, given the availability of ordinal data on regime type, how often, how many of these studies still use a zero, one variable for democracy. That's notably the fact, the, 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 the uh, true for Jaworski's uh, seminal study in 2000. Okay. That's uh, in a way relatively trivial uh, because some, because a lot of people do use polity. Secondly, um, we, we, we posit a duration effect. So we believe that the effect of regime type grows over time. And as I'll explain in a second, it allows us to contrast the impact of regime from the impact of political stability. Okay? I'll describe how we do that in a second. And I think most importantly, we distinguish between democratization and democracy. And I, I think this is one of the real flaws in the, in the literature uh, at, at present. Clearly, transitions are inherently a period of uncertainty uh, in which you'd expect economic agents to defer investment and shorten their time horizons. Okay? And I find striking how often, most recently, the discussions of the Arab Spring as it played out in Egypt, uh, have, uh, having people appear in newspapers or in foreign affairs and say, this shows the dangers of democracy in the Arab world. Um, I would say, no, it doesn't. It shows the dangers of coddling a dictator for 30 years and the uncertainty that happens when that, the, the rules that had been established for 30 years go out the door and you don't have a new set of rules to run a polity. Okay? So uh, uh, it's very important to distinguish this sort of period of uncertainty, of, of great fluidity, and its effect on the economy from what happens once a new set of rules is established. Um, okay. Um, yeah, the, well, perhaps the most famous study on these issues in the IR literature is the Manfield and Snyder study, uh, which shows that, uh, that uh, um, uh, democratizing states uh, tend to... Um, uh, foster greater instability and political violence. Now, what's striking about the study is that if you look at their cases, they're actually not talking about democratization. They're talking about regime changes because they talk about countries which might have, in the mid-90s, you might have believed were going to democratize, like Ukraine, but they never did. 
Okay? But, but second of all, what's striking is how often Mansfield and Snyder get cited as showing that democracy causes ethnic conflict, which is perfectly exactly not what they're showing. And, and suggests again this, how often people in the literature have conflated democratization with democracy. Okay? Um, all right. Okay, so how do we do this then? Um, we uh, use a, a pretty standard uh, uh, cross-sectional annual time series data on 43 countries uh, between 1982 and 2012. Uh, it, the, the format for the economists in the room is the Barrow Growth Equation format in which uh, growth is uh, regressed on uh, a number of, of uh, um, uh, uh, variables which are thought to affect uh, growth. Okay, um, the the key uh, the the key independent variable here is the level and duration uh, of of uh, democracy. We use the polity two variable in the polity uh, version four uh, data set. Okay, um, we use pooled random effects and fixed effect models. Pooled uh, is sort of the most straightforward. Random effects and fixed effects um, uh, um, are a different way of doing dummy variables and, and trying to capture heterogeneity. Uh, a fixed effects are basically country effects, so you, you don't, any, any variable that is, a, is, is, is a specific to a country is not included. Um, uh, and I will not say anything more about that, these models, because that is really my co-author's uh, work. Uh, it matters because our, our coefficients do move around a fair amount, okay? Um, some of you are probably shaking your head, saying, why hasn't he spoken about endogeneity yet? Uh, what, it's basically impossible to have a, a uh, a regression talk in the social sciences at this point without devoting some time to endogeneity. Um, uh, you know, there's a lot of reason to believe that, that growth and, and regime are, are mutually causative, uh, that the causal arrow is not in a single direction. Unfortunately, there is no um, instrument for uh, uh, democracy or for regime type uh, really that's available. I'm, I'm open to suggestions. None has ever been reported in the literature. What we do is the sort of the next best thing is we lag our, our, dependent, our independent variables of interest. Uh, um, assuming that growth today uh, is plausibly caused by the political institutions yesterday. We play around with different lags. Uh, I'll say a bit more about this, but in the absence of finding a good instrument for regime type, uh, I think we're stuck with, with this, and uh, we don't, we're no better or worse than the 84 other studies. Okay, all right, results. I, I admit immediately there's a fair amount of noise. Uh, the results are sensitive to how we specify things, uh, but I think we still can, can make some very clear conclusions uh, about what we find. We find a, a strong, strongly significant low effect, positive low effect uh, of, um, of democracy on growth in this period in Africa. In other words, how, how low is it? Well, uh, an, uh, an increase in, in the, the poly scale by one results in a, uh, I think, 0.1% increase in growth annually. Okay, so uh, real democratization, you're moving three or four points up on the polity scale, uh, and that would assume still less than, than a half a percent growth differential a year. And since this is not always very good data, uh, I think it's a low effect. But it's, it's, a, it's a significant uh, effect. Okay? It tends to weaken in the country effect models, uh, probably because a lot of what's happening to affect growth is country specific. Um, and when we add a political violent variable, it, it further weakens. But mostly we get, uh, in those sort of 15 models that we estimate, we're getting a, a significant coefficient in something like 12 or 13 of the models, okay? Um, there's a, a strongly significant uh, duration effect. 
so that the level of democracy increases the longer and more stable a democracy is. Second, I think really um, uh, interesting result that is, is underplayed in the literature. Um, okay, uh, let me, um, or, well, okay. The transition dummy is significant. Um, uh, unfortunately, it's, we, we, we specified in the narrowest possible way as a transition never lasting longer than a year. And, and I, in the next iteration of this work, I'd like to have longer transition period and really go through the data uh, more systematically to create transition years, in some cases, uh, of two years or so. Um, let me say a word about the issue of stability. So it's, you, you, could, you could complain that what we're showing is essentially a stability effect, that, that when you have a stable regime, like a democracy over time is stable, uh, that this results in increased growth, right? So we tried to we we tried another set of equations in which we tested be, uh, for the interaction between duration and authoritarian regimes. Okay, and interestingly, there uh, we got uh, no significant coefficients and always negative uh, co coefficients. Right, so there's really no significance, but insofar as one determines a pattern, it's a negative pattern. Right? Um, okay, caveats. There's serious measurement issues. I mean, I'm I'm a uh, I take Morton Jervin's work to heart. The GNP data. It's terrible. We played around with using his base years for, I don't know how many of you know Jervin. We played around with uh, a strategy uh, of dealing with w w the countries he identifies as having bad data. Um, we also uh, tried different data sets. So we used the Angus Madison historical economic data set. We used uh, the pen tables and so on and so forth. They, the results are robust to these different things, but uh, it, there's still clearly a problem with, with measurement. Um, the issue of endogeneity is very much there. We can't really do, um, you know, that that well. I, I recognize this is an issue. And finally, the transition variable really does need to be uh, um, recoded. That's the end of my apologizing. Um, let me let me now make a pitch for my results. Um, you know, look, the strong normative preference for democracy means that the burden of proof is for an authoritarian advantage. If you're pro-democracy, all you need to show, it seems to me, is that it doesn't have much of a cost. We do that, we do more than that uh, um, by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, and so it strikes me that this is a strong, very strong result for a democratic advantage. Right? Um, we, we uh, you might say that we biased our regressions to, to find a democratic advantage, but when we do the same regressions uh, to try to find an authoritarian advantage, particularly one involving stability, we don't find it. Right? Um, the point, the fundamental point that I think gets lost is that developmental dictatorships are rare. They're the exception, not the norm. It's amazing how much five countries in East Asia in one region have influenced the discourse on on the development process. In prescriptive terms, if I was a policymaker, you know, I wouldn't advocate that, that Taiwan democratize in the 70s. Yeah, it was doing very well, right? But in the Africa region, and in the Africa region today, if you were going to argue with me about, about Meles in Ethiopia, say, yeah, you know, he, uh, he did a pretty good job of, of promoting growth. But if you think that there's an authoritarian advantage, you have to explain to me not only Meles, but also Mengistu. And the point is, is that the Mengistus tend to uh, uh, outnumber the Meleses about six to one. Okay. Um, all right, so why, just to finish, uh, why this um, persistent myth of an authoritarian advantage? I, I see really three distinct uh, uh, reasons. 
The first is just that, that the, you know, the bias against participatory politics is deeply ingrained in the economics literature. Um, the trade-off between investment and current consumption, uh, the distrust of participatory politics, I think, is, I think economists are just socialized to believe in this, uh, you know, uh, 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 from sort of the first pages of their Econ 101 textbook. Um, in the public policy community, I think you, you, economics has a lot of influence, and so this matters, but I think there's something else going on. And, and here I would say, for one thing, that the, the way in which foreign aid, um, uh, the, the sort of international regime in which foreign aid developed uh, in the 50s was one that assumed authoritarian government. Um, uh, aid, aid went to executives. Uh, um, um, and you know, institutions of horizontal and vertical accountability only serve to slow down and complicate what had been a very straightforward relationship between donors and executives. Right? Um, what do I mean by the post-Brown world? Well, you know, the last the period in which political conditionality had its had its sort of moment in the sun in the development community was in the '90s. Uh, when political conditionality was all the rage, in part because donors were looking uh, for ways to cut their budgets, their aid budgets, and and that's the that was a trough in the in the cycle. Was uh, you know the, I, I know I don't know about Canadian assistance, but American aid uh, was cut repeatedly in the Clinton administration and bottomed out in real terms. I think in 1994. Okay. Then, then uh, you know, the cycle changes, and we get uh, the MDG campaign, you know, and then I think very influentially we get the Brown report. Uh, Brown, the, the the chancellor of the uh, uh, Checker in uh, in the UK, who who argues that okay, we've done it now. We we have democracies now. Let's get back to the business of of moving money. And in the wake of Monterey, with aid budgets again increasing four or five percent a year, uh, anything that slowed down the delivery of funds uh, was was viewed as as basically you know. Uh, uh, a pain and something to be avoided, and I, and I think it's it's since then, and it's uh, that's why I say a post Brown world. It reflects this sort of impatience with political conditionality, because if you take political conditionality seriously, uh, you get a much more chaotic policy process. For example, donors have to interact with politicians and and elections, um, and you get one that slows down the delivery of funds. Right. All right. Um, secondly, there's this, what I call the sausage factory dynamic. Uh, Bismarck or Mark Twain, uh, no one seems to agree, famously said that, that, making, that making sausage is like uh, making laws. You don't want to look at it too closely. Okay? Uh, and, and, I, and, I, and, and I think that there's something to this. Democracies up close never look very good. They, they always look vulgar. There's nothing more vulgar than a politician on the electoral campaign trail, right? They're promising things, they're pandering, you know, they're ta ta telling half lies, uh, and, and this, is, um, this leads always, if you care about a country, if you care about public policy, it leaves you with some uh, uh, disquiet. Um, in, in addition, uh, what uh, Moses Naim called the corruption eruption is, you know, in the old, the good old days when there was corruption, uh, you didn't know about it because there wasn't a free press. Now, there's corruption, you know about it, there's a free press, there are opposition politicians talking about it. And as a result, uh, it seems like there's more corruption than there was before. And this le leads to disgust with democracy, even though it's probably a good thing that, that newspapers are saying bad things about corruption. Okay? So I, I, uh, you know, I'm, I realize I'm running out of time, but I, I, the, the sausage factory dynamic, I think, serves to delegitimate democracy over time, particularly by people who are predisposed not to think much of, of, of democracy. And then the, the third thing I, I want to say is that, you know, there's uh, uh, probably higher expectations vis-a-vis -vis democracies. Certainly, 
huge expectations in the early 90s when you know courageous human rights uh, 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 heroes like the Mandelas of the world you know fought their way out of prison and 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 announced a new democratic era now 20 years later we, we have to deal with Zuma uh, and uh, you know the sheen is off the democracy right um, uh, uh, in addition, the record is mediocre. Uh, not all African democracies are particularly democratic. Uh, uh, you know, um, uh, the, uh, we, we like to say, we have statistical evidence to suggest that democracies spend more on education than non-democracies. But it's disappointing that they don't spend more. You know, we didn't have any expectations that uh, you know that Paul Bia or uh, to mention someone who's not around that Mobutu didn't spend much on education. We kind of assimilated that knowledge, but it's disappointing that that say you know uh, there's not more redistribution taking place in South Africa or that Benin is still one of the poorest countries in the world. Uh, and and I think over time this leads to uh, a more critical stance vis-a-vis -vis, uh, uh, democracy. I will, that ends uh, my talk, so I will take your questions. I uh, am happy to entertain questions in French if, if you wish. Wonderful. Um, just a couple of house rules. Uh, we would ask you very kindly, well, first of all, thank you for a wonderful talk. That was really... I couldn't have done it without your watch. <laughs> um, house rules. Can I ask people please to introduce themselves when they ask questions, just because we don't all know each other and also for the benefit of, of Nick. Uh, we also, we are filming this session, so we will be passing a microphone around. Can you please hold your fire until you have the microphone in your hand and speak? Nicely and clearly into it. And with that, I'll just open the floor. And uh, who wants to go first? So we have Sam at the back. Please excuse me when I do one. Um, Hesam from Graduate School of Public and International Affairs. And I have a bunch of questions. So the first one is like, about the meaning of the word democracy, right? You, you had a, like, at some point you said there is a preferred normative, like, uh, bias towards democracy, right? Mm -hmm. And then I think of some African countries, like, take Guinea Bissau, right? A country, like, very poor, half the population is illiterate, the life expectancy is in the 40s, there's, like, a lot of landmines left from the Civil War, and just, forcing them to have a ballot and people like write names on it. It's just like, and announcing it as a success at some point, like it, it seems obscene to me, like without addressing the real lives of the people on the ground. Right, so, so um, I define democracy, great question. I define democracy in I think the way that most political scientists do as uh, a procedural minimum. I don't claim that, uh, I don't know where, where Guinea-Bissau stands on polity and uh, th data like that. Uh, um, so I don't claim that, uh, as I said very early in the talk, a lot, maybe only 10 countries in Africa are really democratic. Guinea-Bissau, I, I believe, is a, is a semi-democratic country. I, I'm, I'm not sure. Um, but it's clearly more democratic than it was under a single party without elections in the 70s. Okay? So you're saying... You're, you've sat through my talk, and you're saying having elections in a country like that, in that kind of political liberalization, a change of institutions is obscene given the economic needs of the people. Okay? I've just shown you a regression that suggests that that minimal set of institutions, on average, improves the welfare of the people. I mean, so, 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 if you disagree, it's, it's something about my econometrics, or you don't believe in uh, uh, you know, the value of, of, of uh, cross-national econometric regression, or there's some measurement issues. But, but that, that's why it's w worthy of, that's why it's a counterintuitive question. Uh, you know, is, is, uh, it's not obvious 
that, that just adding elections in a country as poor and with as weak institutions as Guinea-Bissau would on average lead to faster economic growth, right? Um, and we find that it does. You want to follow up? Well, yeah, absolutely. We have to give you the microphone back, but I, okay, we have another one. Yeah. I will ask you also to keep your questions relatively short, right? yeah. because I think we have quite a lot. Well, I've, I've kind of challenged him, so. <laughs> no, no, like, first, like, econometrics, like, the, the old joke was, like, econometrics is, like, basically taking data to your basement and torturing it until it says what you want. But uh, that aside, I, I just, uh, like, the other side of it is, like, for the, Authoritarian advantage. I can make a. I can tell you a good story why it works the way like why why it works, like uh, assuming like the econometrics of your paper is correct and I I'm sure it is correct. Uh, like what is the story? How it works? Then? Like that is my question. All right. Um, I, I say, I, I mean, I, in the early part of the talk, I suggest that, that it works because it does promote some, I'm not supposed to move, sorry. Uh, it, it, it promotes some, account, some greater accountability. You know, you weed out the bad leaders. Uh, so the accountability matters. I argue that it improves investment decisions. Uh, you're less likely to have white elephants. Uh, and I, I said that it tends to protect the property rights. Now, obviously, in Guinea-Bissau, these three factors may be less true than they are, say, in a more established democracy like Botswana, right? But that's the argument. That's the story that, that, that I'm telling. We have a question at the front. Uh, I'm Deki Kipuka Kabongi. I am a second year PhD student at Carleton University mm -hmm. in the field of international development policy. I have two or three quick questions. The first one is about reverse causality. Did you try to disentangle from the data when country democratize? Because I think you used a stock approach of democracy, saying that when democracy as a system has accumulated over time, Right. And when the economic performance in those countries have started, because it may be also that their relationship is going from improvement in economic performance, sustaining a democratic system. The second question is about um, how do you how did you deal with those countries where most of economic growth is driven by natural resources like Angola? Right. and Guinea-Bissau, because most of the emerging African economies today are natural resources rich country. Right. The third question right. is about redistribution. Should we, are you more concerned about the relationship or the way the economic benefit is redistributed within the, the society? I see, for example, Zambia. Right has increased economically, I mean, has grown by 5% or 6% between 2001 and 2012, but the in a level of inequality and the poverty is very increasing. So how do you deal with this issue? Right, so I, I didn't, you know, I didn't, um, I didn't want to make the talk even longer by going through the, the something like 30 variables that, that uh, we include at one point or another. But we do include a variable for uh, commodity exports. Uh, so we do test uh, the effect of, of oil. Uh, we do include an, uh, a variable for inequality. Um, um, and uh, I think those are just the two variables that, that you mentioned. So, so they are in our, in our framework. And uh, I, I would have to check. I don't remember what's significant and what's not significant. But uh, again, it's a standard growth regression. And, and in, uh, in these, uh, this tradition of growth regressions, uh, inequality, ethnic fractionalization, uh, export structure, um, uh, foreign direct investment, inflation, terms of trade, uh, human var uh, capital variables like life expectancy. These are all I integrated in the equation. What was your third question? Um, redistribution. Uh, uh, what about redistribution? I mean, are you more concerned about the relationship between democracy and growth or or, or is the distribution? Because in most of those countries, if they have yeah. government yeah. published a report last right. year, 
showing that in all those countries recording high economic performance in yeah. the last decade, you have uh, poverty has increased, inequality has increased, so right. nothing is going to do. So, so I, I believe any study that says that poverty has increased or not increased, but poverty alleviation has not increased in the Afrobarometer countries. That's that's simply not, not true. I, I don't think you can say that about inequality because we just don't have systematic uh, uh, time series on inequality. Um, you know, I think we have on South Africa and on about four or five other countries. We, we did include uh, a very, a very, we played around with inequality. Unfortunately, you immediately get down to um, uh, I don't know. It's something like maybe 20 of the of the of the 49 countries in the region, and you don't have time series data. So it's very hard to 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 uh, to say that inequality is growing or not growing. You know, we know South Africa. We know pretty pretty much. Um, clearly, that <laughs> I'm usually a real stalker when I <laughs> so this is really hard for me. Uh, um, we know uh, pretty conclusively uh, that inequality is increasing in South Africa because in South Africa we have annual Gini coefficients and, and uh, type of data. But for most African countries, we just don't. And, and when you read, by the way, uh, this is the pedagogue in me coming out, when you read that inequality is growing in Africa, um, do not believe it. We don't know. I mean, I'm I'm willing to believe that it is. I, I it certainly I could tell a story about why it is, but we don't know. We don't have the kind of data that allows us to say that it, it is increasing or not increasing. Uh, we it would be it would be lovely to suggest that redistribution occurs in democracies. I, I fervently want to believe that. Um, we have data, again, uh, David Stasavage's study uh, on Africa, Lake and Baum's work on more generally, suggests that uh, uh, there's a positive correlation between investments in education and health and uh, regime types of democracy. Uh, but again, there are real data problems and, and uh, you know, uh, to a certain extent we, um, you know. if you don't believe a regression, of the kind I'm doing, you won't believe Lake and Baum's regression. Yeah. Um. Hi, I'm Stephen Brown. I'm oh. a professor at the School of Political Studies. Thanks for coming and talking to us. I have um, two questions slash comments. One is on the quality of data, mm. because well, I read The Economist and I always hear about um, Argentina lying about the inflation rate. Right. And a book came out recently, and I don't know the title, and I can't remember the author e either, but it was about um, African statistics. Yeah, and more German, I, I, yeah. Oh, okay, that's the one you were citing. Yeah. Okay, basically saying don't trust anything. Right. And you yourself said GNP data is terrible. Right. And then you said a whole bunch of things I didn't understood that made it seem like it was still okay to, to use this data. Right. And I'm wondering, can you say that again in English? Or um, also, I mean, right. if, if governments lie about growth rates, maybe democracies lie more or you know, are more prone to inflate those figures because they need to be reelected. Right. So I needed a little bit more convincing on that. Right. And then, um, Related to that is a question about, um, are you talking about growth per capita or just growth? Because that was the key point in Chavorsky's book in 2000, that democracies had lower birth rates and, and um. that accounted for the difference. And since I'm gonna be a bit nerdy talking about literature, I want to—I haven't actually read Booth, but I've read bits of Booth or about Booth, and I, mm -hmm. and I want to defend him a little bit from, not that I totally buy everything he says, but, his point is not that non-democracies are better, which is sort of how you set it up at the beginning, but his point is that developmental neo-patrimonial regimes are better, which is something that you actually agree with. So, I think. Better than what? Than everybody else, in terms of achieving growth rates. Well, you'll get a chance to respond. Yeah, yeah. But so, I, one of the conclusions might be that these developmental neo-patrimonial regimes, like Ethiopia, like Rwanda, are having among the best growth rates. Right. Um, maybe this is at a cost, repression, human rights abuses, etc., or maybe that's not actually necessary for the developmental state, and the literature is divided on that. Right. So, right. be interesting to hear. Right. Um, I do you want me to go right next? No, no, no. Uh, I was thinking about the so, 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 you know, I, I, was, uh, I, I, I was one of the reviewers for Cornell University Press of the Morton Jervin book. Um, 
And, and he, he, he does make a, a devastating indictment on national accounts data in Africa. Okay? Um, um, does that mean that we give up on cross-national analysis? And I fervently say no to that. I, th I, I think we, we need triangulation strategies, we need to combine single country studies that really look at causal mechanisms carefully. And, um, but uh, if we wanna say anything comparative, you know, uh, the, the A standard, it has to be a regression. I, I, don't, I don't, you know, the alternative is, is, to, is to have a long book about Ethiopia, uh, and then in, in the, at the end of the book that has only focused on Ethiopia, say Ethiopia is a model for all other countries. Okay? And I, I, I don't see whatever the faults you believe uh, uh, you know, are the case for, for regression, I, I don't see how that moves us up in terms of science. Okay? And, and I do think that Booth is generalizing. He's, he's describing this handful of states where one leader has, has made the authoritarian system work, right? Ethiopia under Meles is growing in double digits. He also says Rwanda, but Rwanda is not actually growing faster than the average rate in Africa. It's, it's, you know, it's been growing six, seven percent a year with the continent growing 5.2, 5.5 percent a year. And this is in a post-conflict context. So to me, that's not a miracle level record, right? But, but we do have the case of Meles. Um, um, but, um, you know, I just don't believe it's, I, I don't believe it tells us anything except something about, about Meles's exceptionalism, right? Um, and if you, I mean, his book uh, is, is uh, and, and I'm, uh, you know, Collar's work on elections in dangerous places and uh, 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 Sachs's 2005 book is consistently uh, criticizing um, elections. Elections cause violence, they cause ethnic conflict, uh, they slow down growth, they deter investment. Th these, are, these are causal statements about elections, okay? Um, and and I, I don't think they're justified. Um, now I could, I could do a study of Cape Verde and say, you know, Booth is wrong. Because look, Cape Verde is a democracy and it's got growth, faster than Rwanda's, okay? But what do we then do? We say, oh, well, Rwanda is, is a better case to generalize from than Cape Verde? No, I don't see how you avoid a formal comparison, okay? So that's my defense of regression. Now, I agree it doesn't get you all the way there, and that's why I think it's intellectual honesty to say, look, there are real problems with the data. There always are. Okay, uh, but you know, data is still better than anecdote. I, 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 I just, I believe that to my core. Okay, now um, uh, about growth, it is a, a, a growth, not per capita growth. Uh, that's the, the numbers. Um, and your final question was, oh, on, on developmental patrimonialism. I, I, I know David and I, he, he claims that I agree with him, and that's why I smiled when you, when, uh, when, you said that I don't want to make this about, about David Booth, but I, I, I think um, I view patrimonialism as anti-growth. And I, I'm, in the same way that I'm skeptical of democracy with adjectives, I'm skeptical of patrimonialism with adjectives, right? I, I don't doubt that, that in, a, in, a, in a limited sense, that, that some regimes which have neo-patrimonial tendencies uh, can foster growth for a decade. Or, and we've seen cases like this, you know, going back to uh, the Indonesia of Suharto or uh, different times. Uh, we can uh, even argue about Venezuela under Chavez. And, but personal rule invariably leads uh, uh, to slower growth. Um, it may take two decades, it may take three decades, and, and that's why we were curious about the effect of authoritarian stability. So, you know, do, the longer someone like, like, uh, um, um, I want to say Mamdani, but that's obviously wrong, uh, Kagame um, is in power, uh, you know, um, it's tempting to say, oh, well, once his system's really in place, then, you know, you'll have more growth. But th all of the evidence suggests that, that uh, the second decade of an authoritarian ruler 
uh, leads to slower growth. And actually, that's some of the follow-up work that we're looking at: is the sort of the uh, the life cycle of authoritarian regimes and growth. It's it's the, the it's very dicey because of having to hold all sorts of things constant, but. Um, but we do find that authoritarian stability does not have a positive effect on, on growth, whereas democratic stability, do, or uh, so again, we don't have an O1 variable, but we do find a positive correlation between democracy and um, levels of democracy and, uh, and stability, but not an authoritarian advantage. Sorry okay, for the... Hi, Victor. Two mm -hmm. questions from this side, so two questions, and then I'll make an answer. Uh, hi, Victoria Shore from Foreign Affairs. Um, my question, just because it wasn't touched on, maybe it is a major impact, maybe it isn't, is uh, human rights. So was that factored into the regressions? Did you notice any impacts either way? We, we all know that any government, no matter its type, is perfectly capable of repressing or supporting human rights, depending on which ones you value. Right. So I just want to know how that, how that came into your study. Right, so it would, so, so, um, Human rights, uh, prevailing human rights are typically incorporated in, in the um, uh, regime type variables. You know, so uh, they certainly are in Freedom House. I can't remember in Polity, we played around, by the way, with Freedom House data and get the same results, but for a variety of reasons, prefer the Polity data. So I think it would, but it's not, that's a good question. We don't include a sort of a separate variable for human rights. And you could imagine uh, to test David Booth's kind of ideas of, of having regime type, but then also having something about uh, how bureaucratic it is or how rule bound it is. Right? I, I think we agree that, that say, uh, uh, Poland in the 70s would promote more growth uh, than you know, Equatorial Guinea in the 70s. Because Poland was authoritarian, but it was rule bound. Right? And, and there were way fewer human rights abuses. So uh, I, I think that's mostly included in the regime variable. But if there is any independence, that's, it's certainly worth testing out. Yeah. Uh, I'm Lionel Jocam, a PhD from the University de Picardie Jules Verne in France. Um, I have a twofold question, I'm going to ask it in French. Um, yeah. Déjà, je voulais proposer l'idée d'utiliser peut-être le terme de stabilité politique yeah. à la place de la différenciation entre régime autoritaire yeah. et régime démocratique, parce que finalement, peut-être, c'est plus la stabilité politique qui garantit. Yeah. Uh, une croissance économique à long terme. Et j'ai très bien apprécié votre réponse de tout à l'heure quand vous avez précisé que euh, un régime comme le régime Kagame pendant les dix premières années va peut-être avoir une très grosse croissance, mais après à partir euh, de la deuxième décennie d'un régime autoritaire, on a plutôt une décroissance. Euh, deuxième question, ce serait euh, de savoir pourquoi est-ce que vous n'avez pas ou plutôt ce serait une suggestion. Est-ce que euh, utiliser la variable de, des interventions étrangères, des puissances étrangères euh, dans la vie politique ne serait pas aussi intéressante parce que euh, on sait que la France-Afrique existe toujours euh, et a une certaine incidence sur la vie politique des pays francophones, par exemple. Mm -hmm. euh, et ce serait aussi le cas dans d'autres dans d'autres pays comme les pays euh, hispanophones ou lusophones. Est-ce que euh, ce ne serait pas un facteur aussi à prendre en compte dans la croissance économique, le fait que des puissances étrangères interviennent ou pas Merci. Deux très bonnes questions. Donc, pour la stabilité politique, euh, euh, on, on essaye de, de capter l'impact de la stabilité politique en, de, par notre variable euh, duration. Hein, euh, et, on, et de nouveau, on, dé, on voit que, on trouve que la stabilité politique en interaction avec un régime démocratique, un régime plus démocratique, semble. Euh, accroître la croissance. Ah, donc ça, on, on, c'est un, un de nos, nos résultats. Et on fait, on fait l'opération inverse en interactant euh, stabilité autocratique, et, enfin, stabilité dur, duration et, euh, et, et régime autocratique, et on ne trouve là pas de, de corrélation. Hein? Bon. Euh, en ce qui concerne la gérance, on a une variable pour l'aide et on a une variable pour euh, l'investissement étranger. 
euh, dans, dans notre modèle. Donc on, on capte ça. Maintenant, est-ce qu'on capte de manière plus occulte euh, l'ingérence telle qu'elle a existé en France-Afrique Non. Et je, je serais... Je serais très, euh, euh, très intéressé euh, s'il y avait moyen de, de, de capter ça euh, euh, pour une, une régression économétrique. Hein, comme, comment on ferait un, un chiffre qui capte ça, un index euh, je, je, je ne sais pas vraiment. Um. Uh, thanks very much for the talk. My name is Eric Allen. I'm a professor in the Department of History here yeah. at the University of Ottawa. Uh, I'll start off less seriously uh, by saying that I think the plural of anecdote is data, actually, mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> as a historian. Right. Uh, so two anecdotes is data? <laughs> you know, we could talk about that over dinner, I guess. <laughs> um, Somewhat more seriously, this is actually, I guess, a comment rather than a question. And that's, I mean, I, I take your point that you don't have historical data for inequality. Uh, and so you don't have the Gini coefficient to look at over time. So I guess because it seems part of what you're doing is, is developing the study as an argument for, to reinforce the case for nor the normative case for democracy, why democracy is good, why we should have it. Yeah. And I guess I'd like to think you're not done with your s studies along this line. Yeah. It would be really terrific to find a way to capture a variable for inequality, because if you want to make the case that democracy is good because it promotes greater economic growth, you're going to have some people say, well, what kind of economic growth is, is that the best way to get the kind of economic growth we want? Yeah. Um, well, so yeah, no, I, I would love there to be better data on inequality and, and uh, um, by the way, there's much better data now than there was before and, and um, yeah, no, that, that's right. Uh, um, but, um, uh, you know, there, there's, um, it's very expensive and uh, one of the interesting things about Morton Jervin's book, which I really recommend to, to everyone, is, is just sort of how unmotivated um, uh, governments have been to promote better data, uh, and how partial, I would say, the interest of donors has been. So the inequality data we have is almost uh, very, it's actually different in the Anglophone and Francophone countries, but in the Anglophone countries, it's almost entirely the result of, of the World Bank and its LSMS uh, data collection. And those are expensive surveys, you know. In the Francophone countries, it's been a bit more institutionalized between the French government uh, and, and local governments, lo local statistical offices. Um, but um, but it, it just results in one data point every five years, and, and, and they only exist in, uh, I don't know, uh, maybe 25 countries, you know. And, and then there are issues of comparability, and, and so, um, Uh, and, and I would say, why not use it even though it includes half the countries? Well, the, the missing values are not random, right? Uh, we, can ex we can predict which countries are less likely to have uh, inequality data. And uh, I'll give you a clue. They tend not to be the most egalitarian countries, you know? So, um, so, so yeah, no, I... I now, I'm, uh, I, you know, this is... Uh, This is something that, that the donors and, and, uh, and governments can do. It's not, it's not something that, um, that, that researchers can do. It's, it's just too expensive and you need something systematic. I could go in and do one household survey and anthropologists or, you know, there, is a, there are these kinds of studies. Um, but then what value would that be if I don't go back and redo the same one every year for 20 years? Uh, there, there are a few anthropological data sets that are longitudinal. I have a colleague at Cornell, actually, who's been studying this neighborhood of Kano for, for 40 years. Or he took over his father's uh, uh, data and is continuing it. But those are really, really rare. And unfortunately, he's not interested specifically in inequality. He's looking at other things. Um, Hi, my name is Adam Sandor. I'm a PhD student here at the School of Political Studies. I just had a question about how you control for the informality of the economies across the continent. I mean, even uh, if you take growth rates as uh, a key variable, the data being what it is, it's very, very difficult even uh, in terms of the oil industry to 
assess how much is actually uh, being supported for the growth of, of the economy. Uh, it's very, very clear that the informal economies across the continent trump uh, and dwarf uh, the uh, formal economy. So how do you do that? Because it seems like the informal economy does have a direct effect on the uh, classification of democracy that you have, right? If democracy for political scientists is just the formal uh, holding of elections, every five years or whatever it tends to be on a regular basis. It seems that the informal economy directly supports that happening, for example, in Mali or in Niger or in Senegal, when illicit economies and informal economies support specific candidates in uh, democratic uh, competitions. So how do, you, how do you control for the informal economy in, in uh, your work? Uh, sorry, I don't, I don't get that last So bit. for example, in Mali and in Niger and in Senegal, I have field work information and data, no, anecdotes, uh, that uh, confirm that many candidates are in fact uh, bankrolled by uh, large sectors of the informal economy, uh, uh, entrepreneurs, and drug traffickers that uh, support uh, the formal, you know, like democrati the democ democratic experiments that are happening uh, in West Africa. Right. So that has direct are effect you, on you how implying, you define. Are you implying that they support it more than the formal economy? Uh, as as much, I don't think that like Shell is particular is bankrolling particular candidates as much as people like in the Niger Delta that are yeah. uh, siphoning off gas and oil, for example, and then selling it uh, illicitly, and then bankrolling their own particular candidate who wins in order for them to uh, receive benefits right. from uh, from those proceeds. Right. Um, uh, that's a that's a good question. The the so um, you know economists. Uh, have and national accounts exercises uh, have known about the informal economy for a long time. Um, Morton Jervin suggests that that there that that, that 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 is actually not the primary problem with national accounts data, um, and he gives I think a very compelling argument as to why that's the case. Um, so you know, so uh, the, the the sort of killer example in Morton Jervin is that uh, national accounts data in most African countries, for a really really long time, did not include uh, the cell phone sector. Right, because um, uh, they kept the same basket of goods with which they estimated uh, um, national accounts data, uh, and they didn't change that basket of goods for 10 years. So cell phones emerged, you know, uh, in the late 90s, and within five years had radically altered African economies. And countries which kept the same um, uh, base, the, the same basket of goods with which to estimate their GNP didn't take didn't take cell phone and and all the economy around it uh, into account for for you know until they revised. Famously in the book, and the, the, the book got cited for this again and again, when Ghana changed its space year mechanism for studying, for examining national accounts, uh, GNP went up 70%. Yeah. Um, it, hadn't, it was one of the countries that hadn't changed its a basket of goods in 20 years, right? So, all right. Um, Again, I shouldn't probably tell you this because it's if you if you came into the room skeptical about regression analysis, it's just uh, more grist for the mill. Um, uh, I would say, in terms of of of, of informal economies, that that uh, it's not what's good about doing cross national regressions in in the Africa region and avoiding cross regional analysis is that that structurally these economies are relatively similar, right? So I'm more tr I'm more trusting of of an equation in which the biggest difference and sort of structural difference in economies is between South Africa and Equatorial Guinea than I am one where it's between Equatorial Guinea and Switzerland. Right? So so uh, um, um, uh, so I, I think I mean the, the national accounts is always national accounts data are always uh, a, a kind of estimate of how best to capture what's going on in the economy, and and I mean and going back to the 30s, people who do national accounts uh, um, 
uh, worry about, about the informal economy. So I actually don't believe that they're radically underestimated. I think there are bigger problems with national accounts data. You know? um, but again, I, I, you know, we, 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 we have to triangulate. We have to look at not only national accounts data, but uh, poverty numbers and you know, uh, uh, other areas where we have pretty better numbers, or at least different numbers that, that have different disadvantages, right? Um, but I'm, I'm, I've laid it out, you know, you can criticize it. Uh, why I believe what I believe is out there. And the alternative is, is to say I have a feeling that, that Rwanda is a real success story, you know? Hi, I'm Katie Hi. Cornish with uh, the South Sudan program at the Department of Foreign Affairs. Um, I guess I'm skeptical of the causal relationship. I think yeah. there's evidence of a correlation between elections and, and growth in Africa. Um, I done my MA research on sort of preconditions for peaceful democratic transitions and had found that sort of a level of economic growth was a, that there's a positive relationship with mm -hmm. stable democracies. Um, and that sort of being being linked to the um, having having a basis for taxation and that social contract that's formed between a government and its citizenship, um, but that requires that there's right. people who are working with a level of income to then be taxed. Um, and I think sort of admittedly, the quality of, of these democracies in Africa is quite low and you're using elections as sort of your, your minimum criteria. And when I think of a country like South Sudan where it's essentially a single party state and you have a leader who would have been leading regardless of whether he had come to power through elections um, and then growth through an oil-based economy. And I don't see um, why if, if the quality of, if there's no other democratic qualities to these governments, if they have sort of authoritarian tendencies, um, what difference, in fact, does it make that they came to power through elections? And maybe there's other explanations for the spread of electoral democracy in Africa, along with um, alternative explanations for the growth that we're seeing as well. Well, so, so the, um, of the 49 countries in, in Africa, I think something like 44, 45 have had more than one election in the last uh, 10 years. Okay? So elections have really become routinized. But I don't want you to believe that, that, uh, that all we're looking at is elections. And, and uh, we, 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 you know, the polity data set and the, the Freedom House data set that we played with as well uh, include uh, a civ civil rights, political rights, uh, uh, various mechanisms of horizontal accountability, how the executive is chosen, uh, things like that. So it, it is a bit more sophisticated than just to compare countries that have multi-party elections with those that don't. Because it, 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 on that score, today in Africa, there's no variation. 44 or 45 countries in the region or something like that have multi-party elections, right? So, so um, I, I'm pretty confident in saying that it's a measure of, of how democratic these regimes are based on Schumpeterian, uh, you know, procedural definitions of democracy, right? Um, uh, sorry, so the, so, Oh, I've, I've, so, uh, but remind me now your 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 question um, after this long prologue. Um, I guess yeah, for, for yeah. me, there's an element of sort of maybe reverse a reverse causal right, to what you were. Right. Okay. Yes. 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 Okay. Yes. Yes. I, I think that's that. That was something that really worried me going in. Right. You, if you have a, a country that is democratic, and it starts to do really badly. Uh, imagine uh, Chile under Pinochet. That is a bad example because there's there's foreign intervention. But uh, you know the, the Chilean economy was 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 terrible. Uh, there was chaos. People were protesting. Okay, that is when democracies end. We know we know that. We know that. Uh, and uh, Jaworski and his colleagues showed that at low income levels, the 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 
uh, democracies cannot sustain low rates of economic growth. So I worried that you couldn't do this kind of regression because there, was, there would be a real selection bias of the kind that you're describing. As soon as a democracy didn't do well, it would become autocratic. Okay. In fact, however, we looked at, so the first thing I did when I started this project is I looked at all 49 countries in Africa and I looked how much they had changed on their, um, their scores from Freedom House and Polity. Um, and I thought that any country that, you know, for you to be right, there would have had to be, I don't know, six to 10 of the 49 countries, and which had started out as democratic, done badly, and become autocratic. In fact, um, uh, there are not. I think there, there's something like four countries in the, out of 50, out of 49, that have changed political regimes over this 30 year period, or since 1990, uh, and you know, after they democratized initially. And two of those became more democratic by a, a substantial leap, and two became less democratic. So that sort of, that argument about democracies being specifically vulnerable to low growth rates, I don't think works in Africa in the current era. I, I think it might be true, say, in Latin America in the 60s, but, but not in the current era in Africa. I, I, does that answer your question? We have time for one more question, if we can keep it a little bit brief. As well. Okay, uh, George Jacoby, a retired diplomat, once covered one of those partially democratic countries that was experiencing uh, very high rates of growth, namely Ethiopia. Mm. And uh, I'm wondering what your study says about a policy of democracy promotion in and of itself, but also as a way of promoting uh, economic development. Uh, taking the case of Ethiopia, uh, after the first elections where there was so much violence, uh, mm. the, the donors sort of withdrew some of their assistance, particularly the direct budgetary assistance, because they insisted on a, on a greater level of democratization coming out of that violent period. Um, and uh, there was some improvement in the situation, but then it went back pretty much to the older authoritarian democratic lines. But economic growth uh, continued un unabated in Ethiopia. Yeah. Yeah. Now, should, should the donors have pushed further for further democratization, or would that have injured uh, economic growth? Or was sort of the authoritarian democratic model that you saw in Ethiopia, the, the, the really the, the, the kind of model that you're mm -hmm. focusing on is the best one to promote uh, right. economic right. development? in that particular circumstance? Right. Great question. Uh, just to add to that, for your information, Ethiopia is now also the biggest recipient of Canadian foreign aid. I see, I see. Yeah, I think um, uh, uh, Ethiopia is, that's not, Canada is not unique in that respect. Uh, I, uh, sorry? Huge new gas. Yeah, 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 and, and uh, I think the World Bank yeah gave three billion dollars to Ethiopia last year. It'll be interesting to see what happens in Ethiopia now that, that the great man is, is gone. Um, but, um, oh, so, so great question. Look, I'm, I'm a social scientist, right? And I'm trying to find patterns, right? I recognize that, that policy analysis can use what I do as information, but in terms of the specific, do we increase our budget to Ethiopia next year, I uh, recognize that a regression is of limited utility, right? And I would say political conditionality is more art than science, right? You, you wanna push, you wanna improve things in the long run, but you are aware of how limited your influence is. You, you, you want to maintain dialogue with all governments. I mean, there are any number of, of reasons that, that would lead you to sometimes increase conditionality, sometimes lessen it, right? I, I, I totally, totally recognize that. I, I think when a country is growing by 12% a year, and Miller's was a serious guy. I mean, you know, he, he, he actually read this kind of work, you know? Uh, um, and he had a PhD from, from uh, the Netherlands, I think, and uh, you know, and, and uh, so, I, I, I mean, and, and he clearly found a way in a, in a famously fractious country that had never promoted development. He's, in, you know, he's done some good things. So obviously, I think the donors should cut him a break compared to say, Paul Bia in Cameroon, you know, who's been a disaster for 30 years. 
Uh, I mean, and who gets, by the way, almost as much aid today as, as uh, Ethiopia? Um, so, I, I, and that summarizes what I think about this. I think the donors need to be tougher in terms of political conditionality. I think they need to take into account this kind of finding and not believe that, that the Melezes are anything but relatively rare animals, you know. Um, but at the same time, I recognize that, that, that what you do is a lot more complicated than what I do. And I don't mean to pander, but I, th you know, I think it's just, it's just tricky to how you do diplomacy. It's more art than science. And I, I can't presume to know, you know, what kinds of discussions and promises and relationships occur uh, between the donors and and uh, um, uh, and governments. My, I guess my my main point is that I I think over a long period of time, political conditionality has been inadequate, and that that the donors again and again have looked for excuses to give money to to, to authoritarian leaders who did not do not deliver the goods. And they far, the number of them far exceeds the number who do. Before I uh, thank Professor Van der Waal more formally, I'll just make two quick uh, announcements or advertisements. Uh, Morten Jervin's name has been mentioned a couple of times in references to his book called Poor Numbers. If you don't want to spend money on the book, you can read a lot of his articles in African Affairs. Yes, yes. <laughs> this is how, in fact, how I... Uh, um, learned about him. Yes, was, so uh, that's a yeah. promotional thing. Go to African Affairs yeah. website and read about it. And the other thing is that we are working with Morten Yervin, who's based at Simon Fraser University in Vancouver, to actually come to SIPS and give a talk. So uh, we're hoping that that's going to work out, but it's still a little bit up in the air. And uh, can I add something? Yes. Um, I, I, I'm glad that Stephen Brown is here because he's written, I think, a wonderful piece on the relationship between donors and a lot of these issues. Uh, I think you look at Rwanda, Ethiopia, this democratization piece? Malawi. Malawi, so, yeah. and it overlaps a lot with what I've said today in the latter part of the talk, I, I hope you agree. <laughs> yeah. So all this uh, is to say, watch the space of SIPs, there are more good talks, great talks coming up. I would like to thank Professor Nick Van der Waal for an absolutely marvelous talk, uh, covered a lot of ground, stimulated a really interesting discussion, so please join me in thanking him in a proper Ottawa way.